So here we're taking a look at Endure the Stars. Now this is a cooperative game where players will be working together to complete an objective and in the interim also have to deal with various monsters along the way. The game is played over a series of rounds with each player taking their actions and then the game reacting. Now on a player's turn they're going to be able to do three actions. The first action that they can do is simply to reorganize their inventory. Now that will allow them to move items from their inventory into their head and body slots or vice versa. The important note here is that anything that's not equipped in the head and body slots is not available for a player to take advantage of. The next type of action a player can do is to activate an ability. Now each player has a card here that will have a passive ability but will also have two potential active abilities. The first one can be done for an action anytime on your turn and the other one is is a once per game crisis ability that also takes an action to use. Another thing a player can do is simply to make noise and for each action that they spend they can put out a noise token in the area where they are. They also throughout the game will be able to interact with things on the board such as here in this introductory scenario where we have an objective token here that will unlock the door to the laboratory. In order to interact with it they would spend an action and take the token. They also can simply move on their turn at one action per movement. So in the case of this, he could go one, two, three, or just move one spot for one action point. Another action that they can do is simply to trade. As long as two characters are in the same spot together, they can trade items between them. Now the thing about that is when they do that, they also can take an reorganize inventory action for free as part of that. They also may search. Now search is simply to declare searching and you must be inside one of the rooms. You can't search here in the corridors and you just take the top card from the deck and add it to your inventory and you can discard to make room and such as that. Now, now the thing about search is you can't search the same area twice in a turn. So while this psychic could search here, in order to do another search this turn, she would need to move. So I can move through this open area here and then do a second search action. The last type of action a player can do on their turn is to attack. Now I'm going to go into attack here in a few minutes, but first I want to just go over a few other things that you should be aware of in this game before we go through attack and enemies turns. On a player's board, they have a resolve here. Now, resolve is is going to determine how resolute they are in achieving their mission. However, there are times when they're going to need to check that resolve. And to do so, they're simply going to roll 2d6 and check it against their current resolve. If that number is lower than their current resolve, then nothing happens. If it's equal to or higher, then they would reduce their resolve by one. A resolve check is done anytime a new type of enemy enters their line of sight or whenever an event or boss card indicates that they must do so. Another thing to note about the resolve is you will have these resolve cards here. If ever your resolve reaches the number on this card, then you must take the card out and activate whatever it says. In the case of the psychic here, we've moved down to nine and this card says nine, so we would pull it out. And this is nyctophobia. From now on, you cannot move during blackout. So in the case of this one, it would become a permanent effect on our psychic. Another thing to note is we have these cards up here. Now these are like achievement cards and there's something that you can accomplish in order to gain a reward. So in the case here, this one is end a game round in a zone containing at least two enemies, in which case they would receive a reward. Reroll one armor save. The re the new result is final, so this would be something they could use later. Now I'm gonna go over armor saves since that card happened to mention it during the enemy attack phase. Attacking with the game is fairly straightforward in that you will have items such as a pistol here, which will have a number of stats on them. First you'll have a range, you'll have the number of dice that you can roll for it, the number that it will hit on, and if it makes any noise. In the case of the pistol, it's zero to one, so we could attack from this space to this space. We're gonna roll one d6, and on a four plus we would hit. So in this case, we would hit. 
However, when doing damage to a zone and you declare which zone you're going to attack, you can distribute that damage any way you wish. If you can't kill a monster in that one action, then nothing happens. The damage does not roll over from action to action. Once every player at the table has taken their turn, now it's time for the game to react. Now, the game will react via either spawn tokens or monster miniatures. First, you have to determine whether or not an enemy is in a passive state or an active state. A passive state simply means that that particular radar token or enemy has not been alerted to the presence of anyone in the, any character in the in the game. If it's in a passive state and a radar token here, we're simply going to roll this directional die to find out which way it goes. In the case of this, it would move one spot here. And you'll do that for each passive radar token on the board. Now, radar tokens can be in an active state as well if they've been alerted. And alert means that they've been alerted by noise, potentially. So let's say that there had been a noise token here. This would be considered to be active because it hears this noise because this is one value noise, and this is within one space of it. So this will then try to move two spaces closer to this. So it might go one, two, oh sorry, it might go one and then two. Now the important thing here is anytime a radar token enters line of sight with characters, it is flipped over and revealed. And then the miniatures are brought out. In the case of this one, it is the Icarus and there will be three. So we would bring out three Icarus miniatures into this spot. Active monsters that are in their miniature state have a number of action points that they can spend through their turn, but they're only allowed to spend a maximum of one of those on an attack action. So in the case of the Icarus here, he has two, so he could go one and then two, but he wouldn't be able to attack. However, had he started here, he could go one and then form an attack. Damage is fairly straightforward in that, let's say that these two, this character was in this spot with this one, then that means he would do his damage to this. Now, she would get a chance to do an armor save if she has armor. In the case of this, she has preservation armor, so she would get to do an armor save against that. And on the case of this, that's a six plus. Oh, rolled the wrong die. That's a six plus, and she doesn't get it, so the damage would go to her. There are rules in the game that you can look up for determining who gets hit if there are multiple characters in the area. In addition, for each damage they take, not the value, but for each damage they take total from an enemy, they will also have to roll the injury die. Now, the injury die will determine if they take an injury in one of their slots, such as the head, the body, or the legs. In the case of this one, we did roll a leg injury, so she would have now a leg injury on her. Now, that will result in various ailments to befall the character. If if it's the head, then their combat range goes down. If it's on the legs, then their maximum movement range is restricted to two, uh, turn, two areas per turn, etc. Once all the enemies have taken their turn, then it's time for the resolution phase. In the resolution phase, we're going to draw a card from this deck and perform whatever it states. In the case of this one, it is a blackout, movement restricted to two zones, and weapon range reduced to zero. Now that will stay in effect until the next resolution phase. Now beyond Beyond what we've covered here, there are some advanced rules in the book that will add more variation to the game, as well as some, some mission and campaigns that will get increasingly more difficult as the game goes on, and you can play them either as a standalone or as a campaign. And if you do it as a campaign, there is a refuge that you can look up that will allow the characters to try to heal or gain some additional benefit through between missions. In addition, in the book, there is a summary here of the monsters with a chart indicating their particular actions, range, and health, and things like that. And there's also some clarifications on the cards and their various effects. Beyond that, there are various rules that will happen based on campaigns, and there are doors, and one thing I didn't notice, uh, didn't note, is that players cannot actually open doors once they've been closed. There must be another way to open them, the same way monsters can't either. But you'll play through until either you've completed whatever the objective is of the mission you're playing, in which case the players have won, or all of your survivors have been eliminated, in which case the players have lost. Let's look at Endure the Stars. Now, I will start out this review by saying I had no preset expectations of the game, as I honestly hadn't heard of the game prior to playing it. 
Starting with the good points, the miniatures in the game are very well sculpted, They and the theme of the game is very well represented throughout. And I did really enjoy the whole aspect of the enemies being hidden until you actually encounter them or they spot you. And that's not something I see in a lot of games, and I've really enjoyed the way that worked out in this game. Thematically, everything in this game makes sense, and you really do get the feeling that this game was designed with the theme in mind at all times. However, with that said, on the downside, the miniatures are actually my first problem with the game. And again, it's not that they're bad miniatures, they're really good. There are just too many of them. You're never going to use all of the enemies that are included in the box, and that's a problem for putting the game away. It feels like the miniatures were over-designed and over-produced in such a way that it took away from other aspects of the game they could have been working on. The artwork in the game, while tr as I said very thematic, is a little dark and players with less than perfect vision may have a hard time seeing elements on the board. I know that I did each time I played. The enemies, as I said, being unknown is a really cool mechanism within the game. However, when you flip over those tokens, there's nothing other than a picture indicating what the enemy is. And for the first few times you play it, you're going to have to go into the rule book and look and match it up to see. And it's going to knock you out of the theme of the game. And I just wish they had taken the time to maybe put the name of the enemy on those tokens. Speaking of tokens and components, the components in the game are good-ish in that the tokens themselves are very small, and I couldn't find a good reason for them to be so small. They're, they take away from the gameplay itself. Just doubling their size would have made for a better experience. The cards within the game, especially the event cards, they are very sparse. There's very little text on them, and the first few times you play, you're going to have to go into the rulebook to find out what they actually do. There's no artwork on the cards, so I can't find a reason why they didn't just explain what the card does in better detail on the text itself. There's some other head-scratching rules in the game, such as the line of sight and the, the number of times you're rolling dice for enemies at the end of each round, and it just really knocks you out. I really hate to say this, but I felt like we were rolling dice too much in this game. Dice rolling doesn't bother me, but it does when it starts to feel monotonous, and unfortunately in this game it does feel a little monotonous. The gameplay itself is also fairly lackluster and not in the theme. Again, as I've stated, this game is very thematic and I did enjoy that. But after a while, it starts to feel unchallenging. The enemies aren't particularly interesting after a while, and frankly, you could figure out quickly that you can hole up in a room and just get the best weapons through searching and then just blow through the rest of the mission. This becomes an even bigger issue when you're playing through the campaign mode. Overall, I can in good faith recommend the game. This game will appeal to some players, especially those who are looking for something maybe similar to Zombicide that has a different theme. Maybe Zombies doesn't work for you. Maybe you want something in space, in which case this is a game you're going to want to take a look at. For me personally, this is going to be an in and out game for me because frankly, I can't find a reason that I would want to play it long term beyond through the campaign once. Combine that with a not that well written rulebook, although I will state they have updated the rulebook since the original release of the game, and there is a nice FAQ for it. And if you are looking to play this game, I definitely recommend getting that updated rulebook and checking out the FAQ, as it will make your experience better. I just find myself not wanting to play this game. I just can't find any reason why I would play this over, say, Zombicide or even the others, because it has that similar feel to it. And in a lot of ways, this feels like Zombicide in space. And for some, as I said, that will be a good thing. For me personally, I'm not going to keep this game, but I hope this has given you an idea of whether the game might be something you want to take a look at or not, and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.